Good evening, everyone, and um, welcome. Um, I'm extraordinarily pleased to be able to host this evening's event. Um, what does the Biden presidency mean for global climate goals? Uh, a joint event that we're hosting between Imperial College London and the Forum and the Policy Institute at King's College London. And this has been organised in part because it's Sustainability Week at Imperial College and there are lots of events on all week. Um, and in part really in response to the, the Biden presidency and, and really as a way to convene a, a discussion and have a sensible debate around what we think it means. And I'm delighted that we've got a really excellent panel. So hopefully it'll be a, an excellent discussion. For those of you in the audience, um, you can use the Q&A question function to pose some questions to the panelists. Um, we'll be monitoring them and, and posting them to you. Um, so, so please do feel um, engaged and, and, and offer your opinions and questions. Um, we want this to be a very inclusive event. Um, so I'll just introduce our, our speakers. Um, I'm really pleased to, to welcome them. So first of all, we have Professor Tim Benton, who's the Research Director for Emerging Risks, Director of Energy, Environment and Resource Management at Chatham House. Welcome, Tim. Next, we have Professor Franz Burkhout, who's the Executive Dean from the Faculty of Social Science and Public Policy, and he's a Professor of Environment, Society and Climate at King's College London. My friends. We have Elisa Gilbert, who's the Director of Policy and Translation at the Grantham Institute for Climate Change and the Environment here in Imperial College. Hi, Elisa. And last but not least, um, joining us from the other side of the Atlantic, Professor David Gilbert, who's David Victor, who's a... Your, your title is too long, David. Um, you're a Senior Fellow, Foreign Policy, Energy Security, Climate Initiative at the Brookings Institute, and Professor of International Relations at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California in sunny San Diego. Um, and I should just warn our audience, David does have to leave us um, at six o'clock UK time in order to go to, to brief the US government on some of these issues. So if you have questions for David, please make sure you get them in early so we have a chance to, to get some of his opinions. So I'm just going to turn to the panel and ask them really the, the, the highlight topic and just spend a couple of minutes giving your perspective on, on what the Biden presidency does mean for global climate goals. So I come to you first, Tim. Uh, good. Hello, yes, yeah, good evening, everybody. Good morning, David. Um, mm -hmm. Three main messages from me. Um, I will leave David to talk about the domestic agenda uh, in the US. Um, because clearly the speed with which Biden might or might not uh, stimulate a low carbon transition away from the years of Trump is, is, is a key thing. But I'll focus on two further things. Uh, one is uh, to lead by example. And the what we've really missed in the last four years uh, uh, it has been a lack of a major voice um, to, sh to back up what UK European Union is saying in the kind of global sphere um, and I think to lead by example as a global citizen includes uh, being part of the Paris Climate Agreement and all of the stuff that goes with that and I dare say we'll talk about that a, a lot in, in detail but there is a much broader agenda that we sometimes forget in the climate sphere and that is about ensuring that we live in a multi plural world where there is international cooperation and one of the big things that I think we need to um, encourage and drive towards is for example making sure that the WTO is a functional organization that deploys its trade uh, uh, ability to regulate and green trade to avoid the sorts of issues that have happened in the last four years where uh, Brazil has uh, freely deforested uh, to uh, uh, put soy on the on the global market and nobody has has led any kind of backlash against that beyond the European Union. So lead by example, be a good global citizen. And then obviously part of that is is to drive forward climate ambition. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, I think there's quite a lot of scope for the US to try and drive China and perhaps even India in terms of having a competition to see who can be the greenest nation, because the benefits of having a green industry are uh, absolutely 
um, important. I mean, China has made a lot of money out of exporting PV to the to the world. Can America make a lot of money out of Tesla and exporting Teslas to the world and, and all the rest of it? There are other aspects to this. Uh, develop and facilitate international standards that are particularly around the low carbon transition. You know, I grew up in a at a time where there was a global war between VHS and Betamax over <laughs> videos, and we want to avoid that sort of things when it comes to kind of battery standards and all the rest of that. Uh, work with uh, other uh, leading nations to create a community of ambition, and there are some situations where a close uh, working relationship with the UK and the EU and, and others might drive things forward, um, and particularly to align trade and aid, as well as UNFCCC and all the rest of that to deliver outcomes in the global south. So it's not just about NDCs, it's not just about uh, low carbon transitions in the United States, it's about all of these things that contribute to the potential for a more sustainable world. Over. Thank you for that and I'm sure there's many of those topics we're going we're gonna to pick back up again over the next hour. Um, can I come to you friends? Sure, so I have three points too, very quickly. Um, so I think the first thing is to point to the, the volatility of US politics. Uh, you know, a country that nearly elected Donald J. Trump twice as president uh, and where clearly um, who is the ultimate climate denier and who has a huge political base still, who are still there, uh, and who knows what will happen in 2022 uh, in the congressional elections then. It means that the underlying politics around climate change in the US, despite of course all our hopes and the great change that's happened with the election of Biden, um, the underlying politics remains extremely fragile. So that's the first thing I think you need to kind of state and understand and anything that we say about Biden's policies will be very much informed by his vulnerability in the longer term. The second point, and that leads to this, is that the US has always been an entirely unreliable partner in international climate politics. Um, this is true if you go back to the Rio um, UNFCCC ag agreement, Kyoto, where the Americans really played an unproductive role. At Copenhagen, the great standoff between Obama and China, and indeed, of course, even at Paris, where the Americans played a more important role in bringing China and to a certain extent India to the table. In fact, US policy has always been determined also by the reciprocal responses in some of these other large countries. And, you know, Biden's relationship with China is going to be every bit as difficult, we expect, as Trump's relationship has been. And that will, I think, very much also determine what he chooses to do or what he feels able to do politically at home uh, on, on climate change. So US policy is determined by China policy, a Chinese climate policy too, and that uh, doesn't seem to have changed a great deal either. And so the idea that the US has suddenly become a reliable partner, I think, is probably a bit of a myth. And so Europeans need to continue to be pretty sceptical, actually, about a US capacity to take positive positions and to drive through. And the third point I'd make is that if you look at the Biden climate plan, it's actually very inward looking. It's all about infrastructure. It's about American jobs and crucially then also about the trade relationship with China. It's to do with competition internationally, economically around these kinds of issues as well. It doesn't actually say, I mean, of course, they've, you know, they've, they've rejoined Paris. If you read the Biden climate plan, certainly the one I read before the election, there was nothing about American leadership and uh, its role in the world. So I wanted to start by being pretty damn beat because I think it's too easy at a moment like this to look forward and be very optimistic. But we have to be also very realistic and look to history and try to interpret from that what Biden may in fact be able to achieve. So I thought I'd just start with that as a different perspective. Thanks. 
Thank you, Franz. And yeah, that was a point I wanted to come to. So um, I'm, I'm glad you already started with, with it straight out, straight out of the blocks. <laughs> Elisa. Yep. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so, of course, continuing to add to the number of three point comments. <laughs> um, of course, I agree with what, what those speakers said before me. I think whilst whilst agreeing that um, that, as you said, France, the US isn't necessarily the most reliable long term climate partner. I think this change of leadership has come at a really important time for us in the UK. So we are about to be the president of the next negotiations um, on climate change in November this year. Um, and at the same time, we've just experienced a big shift leaving in our membership of the EU. And the leadership, or at least even if it's a four year leadership on climate from the US, is really important for us in the UK as a critical friend. Um, I think it will help us ensure that in our next stage of developing our policies and our trade agreement, perhaps with the US, climate is part of that. Um, and I think it also enables us to perhaps be able to achieve the ambitions we want at COP26, both in terms of commitments on finance, mitigation and adaptation, but also on beginning to demonstrate that key countries like the US are going to deliver on those. So I think um, we get the critical friend we need at the moment we perhaps need it most. Um, I think then there is really a question around whether um, Biden's arrival will actually provide the responsible global citizen that we also need. And I think that some of the comments France made actually brings that question to light. Not only is the Biden plan quite inward looking, um, it has the potential, perhaps with this very um, aggressive export policy, to maybe undermine or not give the best attention to other parts of the world where we need it the most. But it does have the potential to, for example, through their aid program, deliver good, strong support on impacts and adaptation to climate change. So I'm hopeful that we can see at least the US take on this responsible global citizen role. Um, but finally, and perhaps most importantly, is the messaging. Um, so now we have someone in the White House who is going to acknowledge that climate change is real and urgent. And whether that is primarily through domestic agenda, that's also great. We also need at least a strong um, domestic US agenda. And I think some of the messaging that's coming through about just transitions is very important globally. And if that's pushed through in the US, that's something that we can also translate to a strong and important just transition international agenda. Thanks, Elisa. David. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Terrific to see my good friend Tim Benton on the panel here. Um, look, I, 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 well, I want to take my two points and make them into three points. Since that's <laughs> point. um, and I want to just say that that I think France's diagnosis is correct. Um, so first, you know, it, having the Biden administration there is great in the sense that you know it's better than Trump. <laughs> Take what you can get. So that's kind of faint praise, but it does make everything easier. It makes it easier to put uh, pressure on governments that are doing nothing. It makes it easier for all nations around the world to develop policies. It's harder for groups that don't want to do anything to point to the largest economy, uh, depending on how you measure and uh, and say, hey, they're not doing anything, so why should we do something? So uh, all of that is a step forward. It'll be easier for to get the multilateral development banks involved. Uh, and there's a lot of important work that they're doing. It'll be easier to put some pressure on China, notably around the Belt and Road Initiative, which is the place where we really have to focus. The second is um, there's no question that climate has received more attention in the last electoral cycle in the United States than any time in history. The team uh, around Biden is stronger on climate than for any president in history. All of that's great. Everything they do, almost everything they do, with a few exceptions, will be refracted through domestic politics, as other people have, have, have spoken. I guess we shouldn't be shocked that nations are making decisions by thinking about, you know, whether they get reelected. Um, that's you know, hardly new in, in world politics. Um, I, I do think um, this will have a big, in, big but unknown impact right now on what the United States, the United States is actually able to to commit to because we're doing a lot of domestic infrastructure and with some clever uh, legislative maneuvers and so on. But I think we have to remember that the median vote, median senator in the United States is not a Green New Dealer. The median senator of the United States is from West Virginia, Joe Manchin, barely reelected last time. He is a coal country. 
or it's Angus King, who's an independent from Maine. Everyone in Maine is independent. And so these are folks, the kind of middle of American politics is gone. And I say that as a centrist. So uh, the country's become more polarized. We're not unique in that regard. And so you should see this refracted through domestic politics in particular, the so what, what, a just transition or environmental justice questions where huge commitments have been made for the fraction of money that's raised for, for economic stimulus that will be devoted to those topics. And those topics are not identical to with the low, lowest cost way of cutting carbon. So that's the second point is the domestic politics point is, is going to be really, really crucial. I think the sleeper issue here is going to be what we, what we call in Europe just, just transition. Last point I'll make is that, that what to me is really striking as an international relations scholar is how the world has moved on. The United States at the federal level was asleep for the last, well, worse than asleep. They were awake and tweeting for the last four hours, four, not hours, well, I wish, <laughs> years. And, um, and the rest of the world has moved on. And so uh, we we have, in some sense, the aberration in American history is the period right after the Second World War when the U.S. did play these leadership roles. And I think the earlier comments made that we're not going to be, you know, the big global leader, kind of global cooperation for cooperation's sake. That's not going to happen. We did the easy thing, which is to rejoin Paris. But all these other institutions are fragile. The WTO, the Mexican relationship, the bilateral with Brazil, it's a train wreck. Um, so, so those are all areas of the China relationship. Those are all areas where those tensions don't go away. And those tensions, I think, will condition what's really feasible uh, for, for the United States. So you're going to see this, last comment I'll make very briefly, you're going to see this in this beauty contest that's about to unfold about who's got the more aggressive 2030 target, where the expectations for the U.S. are going to be far outside what we can do credibly inside the country. And, and um, that will be on display very soon. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Very provocative starting statements. And I'm just going to follow up, David, with you, I think. Um, so, so Francis' point that the US has historically been an unreliable partner. Um, do, do you do you agree with that statement? And do you think it's something that Biden would acknowledge or his team would acknowledge? And do they want to change that in reality or perception? And, and, and if the answer is yes, how would they go about that? Well, I think they want to change that. The people around Biden himself and the people around him are kind of globalist by temperament yeah. and institutionalists um, by, by training and experience. But the question is whether they can do it in a way that sticks. And I think that's that's where what Franz said is exactly right, is, is if you're going to do a whole bunch of things inside the country that are mainly done by executive action, that can also be reversed. And everyone knows it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> about our system it's always embarrassing to see your you know your, your kitchen on display in the, in the planet and uh but so the things to watch are mm -hmm. less washington they're they're more what do the capital markets do what do the states do uh those are actions that that are one they're more unidirectional mm -hmm. and and i think you know there's a larger question which is which is not for our today's panel which is what happened to america mm -hmm. and because our, our, we used to be the reliable leader. If you go through the Montreal Protocol, the U.S. was the reliable leader. Then starting around 1990, 1991, really when the Republican Party became seized with, with uh, more, more, more polarizing figures, and then the Democrats responded by becoming polarizing in their own way, and the American politics, for a variety of reasons, went started going out to the polls, then, then it became much harder to be a reliable international leader because the, the international position uh, starts first and foremost with what you can do at home. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tim, did you want to follow up on that? You were nodding. I no, I really agree with with <laughs> with David David's analysis. And I mean David David is the expert in this. But I mean, in a sense, we've had a similar journey. So it's not just American politics and many countries around the world have become far more polarized and far more driven to the extremes, and there isn't really a centrist position left. <laughs> and so where does the consensus come from? that we're in this together. And if we're not in this together, then we end up in this kind of slight race to the bottom that everything's polarized and you're either idealistic on one side or the other side, and then paralysis happens. But at least the advantage, the, the positive thing I would say is at least with some control of the Senate after Georgia, mm -hmm. there is there is a greater chance than there was had that not happened of putting stuff in the, in the sand that can't be reversed on the next executive yeah. action as per today's news that Trump might be the front runner again <laughs> next time round. Oh my God. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So a lot was made, I think, in the press about the appointment of John Kerry as the climate envoy for, for climate change. 
how big a deal is that? Is it how significant is it both in terms of his appointment and his position on the global stage? I don't know. Elisa, maybe do you want to come in on that? Um, again, yeah, I'm not not a scholar in global politics. Well, I'm, I'm going to come to I'm going to come back to David in a minute, but I don't want to feel like I'm putting him on the spot. <laughs> no, I think I think um, what is really noticeable is that Biden has a really really experienced team. I think mm -hmm. that's just you know vital. Um, these are people not only who have experience with international diplomacy, but they have a lot of experience with international climate diplomacy um, and probably even know some of the key characters involved. So I think that's why it's really important that John Kerry's there. One of the things that David said that's, of course, vital is this recognition that a lot has changed in the past four years. Um, the emissions profiles have changed, the technologies available and the costs of technologies have changed, the scale of impacts and where they've been felt for climate change has changed, um, and the, the kind of positions of leadership that different different organizations have been taking has changed. So it's, it's fantastic that we see a really strong team around Biden with experience, um, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, hopefully they're experienced at listening as well and making sure they absorb that changed environment before they go in with the new US agenda. David, do you think Kerry's environmental credentials make a difference? Oh yeah, but but more than his environmental credentials are his foreign policy credentials. I mean, mm -hmm. In some sense, what's really unusual is you have, in effect, a secretary of, well, I would probably be shocked to say, but in effect, the secretary of state for climate change, yeah. in addition to the secretary of state for everything else, uh, and John Kerry knows everybody, and I would say, even more importantly, the people around John Kerry know everybody in all the key countries. And so um, you'll see them engage effectively around the run-up to COP26. I'm, I personally am watching even more closely the campaigns. So these, these initiatives, five major initiatives around key topics like, like finance, like light-duty like vehicles, that'll be easier for the U.S. to engage uh, around because um, it's less the machinery of the COP and all the kind of gumming up that happens there and more specific actions, things that can connect back to the heartland, uh, places where, you know, the U.S. could see advantages. So I, I think all of that is, is auspicious. I will say my, my colleague at Brookings, Tom Wright, wrote a very insightful piece um, a month or so ago, and also writes lots of insightful pieces, but this one about a month, a month or so ago, raising a warning flag actually with the, the foreign policy establishment in the U.S. because you've got, you know, climate's an issue, but you've got all the kinds of other things going on. You got the South China Sea and you got the WTO and you got the U.S.-Mexico relationship. And so there are indeed among the foreign policy establishment concerns that we not let climate overshadow everything else. And that we'll, we'll see soon some tests. My guess is the China, the China relationship will be the, the place where this really gets tested as to whether you can kind of walk and chew gum at the same time, climate and other topics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to bring Franz in on the China question. I mean, to what, I mean, to what extent is, is China really the key to this? And then, you know, the, I guess, and other global superpowers, but critically China. Well, I think as I made the point, I think actually the stance of China has always been critical to shaping American attitudes and actually the role they play. And that's a historical content, con constant and it'll be so for, for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, the, the, the two largest economies, the two largest emitters uh, and so on. And, and, you know, in fact, what you see is a, a very different pattern in the Chinese posture on climate, which is, you know, a progressive um, acceptance that they needed to play a role, certainly after Copenhagen, also with emissions targets and so on. An industrial strategy, which is very much focused on, on creating new sectors and markets and winning uh, an international competition around technology. And they did that very, very early. I mean, I, I remember going to Beijing in the early 1990s. And when you arrived at the airport, the pictures on the walls were wind turbines. So it's not like they've invented this recently. They've been doing this for 30 years. They've been building industrial and technological capacity to do this. And this is something that's very deep seated. And then you know, finally, what they get is is all the credits internationally, the reputational benefits at a time when everyone worries about, you know, human rights abuses and surveillance and, you know, everyone is down on China for political reasons as well, but also just because they fear the rise of China. Here is China, certainly in Paris and afterwards, playing this very, very positive role and Xi Jinping 
winning a lot of friends and uh, influencing people. And they will continue to do that. So where you've had this very fractured and rather erratic and changeable American posture, in fact, what you have is this gradual accumulation of conviction and alignment in um, Chinese domestic industrial policy and Chinese diplomatic and foreign policy posture. And that is so fused now and works mm -hmm. for them so well that that isn't, that isn't going away. And in a way, the great challenge for the Americans is to develop mm -hmm. a similarly enduring and stable political co coalition that can allow them to compete with the Chinese on the international stage. Okay, Tim, would you like to comment on that? Um, yeah, no, I think I think uh, Franz is, is is exactly right. Um, the issue in my mind is the extent to which uh, we all in the West and particularly China, we want to maintain strong cooperations. As, did I say China just then? I meant the US. Uh, we want to maintain strong cooperation with China over climate, mm -hmm. recognizing the existential threat that we're all in together and whether or not we go into, uh, uh, I hate the, using the term Cold War, but I think it's kind of indicative, back mm -hmm. to those sorts of two powers days where no one talked to each other, but we still managed to negotiate on on the matter of existential threat, which was nuclear arms in, in those days. Are we going to be in a situation where UK, Europe turn a blind eye to everything to in order to cooperate with China because mm -hmm. of the climate issues? And where will America then position itself? Because Biden has already said he doesn't want the kind of human rights issue to be swept under the carpet with respect to uh, climate cooperation. So does that put him out and, and the US out of step with, with the UK and America? Or is it going to be like it was a bit in the Trump days? If we're not on America's side, we're America's enemies and therefore we have to make a choice between US cooperation and China cooperation. So that whole dynamic of how US, China and the, the European partners fit, fit together, I think is absolutely key to realising some of these things ahead. But Franz is exactly right. I think there is lots of evidence of real conviction at the heart of, of China's decision making. The mm -hmm. announcement of the zero net carbon goals, uh, you know, was a case in point, grasping mm -hmm. a political moment, uh, you know, to, to make a point to, the, to, to America. That's going to continue. They're driving the transition very fast. Forty five five year plan is all kind of heading in the right direction. Um, the political dynamics at the top level is engaging all of these uh, these matters in a way that it hasn't done in the United States, as, as, as David has said. So, you know, good news in one regard in terms of their climate ambition, but lots of stickiness about how we relate to them as a Western hemisphere, really. And I guess just also thinking about the, you know, the speed of the commitments in China. I, you know, there, you're right, there's, there's, there is a conviction and, and Franz's point about this has been a long term technological investment as well, so that they are ready to take advantage of the transition. But it's still quite a long time out in terms of their actual commitments. And, and I guess is there, a, is there scope or is there will to try and push China to be even, I guess, faster in their tra transition? And, and right now they're the leading space, right, for, for the global power compared to the US. David, I wonder if there's any sense in the US that you know you want to regain there was a regain some of that leadership and is there is there at all the conviction to do it and to, to move China even further? Well, um, amongst this is where the difference in the points of view really mm -hmm. matter. So amongst the climate people, yeah, everyone who's a climate mm -hmm. analyst says, hey, we want to get China to do more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the caloric content of leadership is very low. Uh, and so leadership for leadership's sake is just not the kind of thing that's really going to be durable in this fragile political environment where the center is 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 hollowed out. So the climate people want the Chinese to do more, and they want us to do more in the U.S. so that we can push the Chinese to to to, to do more. I think the logic has been laid out here uh, of what are the incentives for China to do what it's doing. That logic is correct, which is the creation of new industries, mm -hmm. and they're also sober about how quickly that can happen, how quickly the domestic picture can happen. And I think one of these great ironies. Of when you study compliance with international environmental uh, pledges, at least, is that the countries that are not democracies may actually have higher compliance rates 
than the democracies because in the democracies you have this incentive to just pledge and pledge and pledge for really ambitious things because you've got everyone beating up on you to do something about climate change. Whereas in the Chinese case, I, I believe in that zero by 2060. I think that's in line with what they can actually deliver. And that's the reason it's 2060 and not 2050 and, and, and so on. So I, I guess one last thing I'll say is about the incentives, which is they're trying to build new industries, but the other thing they're trying to do is avoid the trade trade measures. The the discussion about trade measures, you know, starting with airlines or earlier than airlines, I guess, um, with with wood products of various types uh, uh, and forest products. The discussion of trade measures in Europe has had a huge motivating influence on a lot of firms and governments around the world. So keep doing it. Um, it's a little bit like negotiating with a loaded gun sitting on the table. You want to make sure the gun doesn't accidentally go off and shoot somebody, but it has a very big motivating influence. And that's, let's not underestimate the impact of that on why the Chinese are doing what they're doing, including us, frankly. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Elisa, did you have some thoughts on the global dynamic? I mean, yeah, a few thoughts about China. I think one of the things we know from working in partnership with some of the other universities in China and other research institutes is there's a lot of pressure coming internally from some quite influential parts of the, you know, of 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 the of the thinking intellectual capital in China. And so I, I agree with David. I think importantly that 2060 target is completely achievable by China. And there are also bits and pieces of people in China trying to make that more ambitious. So I think that's also quite powerful internally. The other thing I'd say is that when we talk about the US-China dynamic, it's easy to be focused on what each of those two countries can deliver themselves. But of course, what's hugely important is what they're also doing um, with other parts of the world and their investments. And this goes back to the, the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative in China and the way in which you can define your net zero target within a country within your own boundaries. Um, but at the moment, that does not include um, other important parts of your, you know, your trade complex. Um, and it's really, really important that uh, the relationship between the US and China doesn't become also so toxic, that it also really influences what all of these other countries can achieve. Um, so that's also a delicate balance. There's a potential for strong action in the US and China to actually help those countries, but there's also a strong potential for it really to undermine them. Okay, so I'm going to go to a question from the chat, and um, I think this is for you, David, to start with, but um, it's from Anonymous, and, and I guess the question really is about demographics and changing demographics, and, and whether the, the climate crisis is, is such a partisan issue among younger people. Um, it is, do we see the same patterns across all different age groups, or, or, or is the future, is the future demograph actually fully bought into the climate science? Yeah, so younger people are more worried than older people. That might be rational. <laughs> so, um, you know, heaven forbid people be rational. Uh, maybe selfish, but rational. Um, there's a lot of reasons why the younger generation is more engaged with this, and that's that's a hope. Um, it hasn't yet really fundamentally altered the Republican Party. As a Democrat, we need a less crazy Republican Party because we need somebody we can work with. Right mm -hmm. now, we don't have anybody we can work with. We have these Looney Tunes who are, you know, 35, 38% of the electorate who are voting reliably for Trump or you know, after Trump, whoever is going to be after Trump. And then you've got this kind of fragile shifting coalition of traditional Republicans who you know, care about the environment because they like the hunt and fish and walk and other, you know, quaint things like that. But they're not organized and they're mm -hmm. terrified of the far right. And 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 that the younger generation has not been able to organize that part of the Republican Party yet. I'm actually very skeptical of, that the party will be able to get its act together. Uh, we'll see a lot of this in the next in the next electoral cycle in 2022. But um, that's what I'm looking for, actually, more than the demographic shift. I'm mm -hmm. looking for the Republican Party, the, the center, to to get itself better, better organized. And is there, I mean, another question is, is there really an educational aspect to this? Can Biden's presidency and the current government change perceptions around climate science? Um, or is what they're doing just going to further stoke divisions, right, and further polarise people in the in the Republican Party? Well, we have a tendency to pretend we know things that we don't know as analysts, right? So, so we ought to, actually, a large number of questions we should put big error bars around. I don't fully know the answer to that question. My my yeah. hunch is the the Biden presidency will have almost no impact on people's 
real embrace of climate science because so much of the way they interpret that information is refracted through other mental models, in particular partisanship. If you look at, at look at the the analysis on what explains people's attitudes about climate party affiliation and ideological ideology even more than party affiliation ideology really is a dominant mm. explanatory that's not going to go away quickly and and frankly a, a lot of the policies you know big infrastructure investments green investments uh, you know moving more rapidly away from coal all the stuff that we need to do and is overdue that will for the 35 percent or so of the electorate who's suspicious of whatever is going on mm. in washington anyway be seen as reinforcing evidence. And so you're gonna see a whole bunch of the center right part of the Republican party using mm -hmm. conspicuously not called the Green New Deal, but as a big infrastructure program, trying to find a way to link their messaging uh, to, to, to use that as, as evidence that the Democrats are out of control and they're you know, basically goss plan revived. So I'm gonna to come to you, Francis. There's a question in the chat from Elena, I think, about whether whether governments really see climate leadership as giving them strategic advantage in other areas, or whether it's kind of an additional, I must say, I'm, I'm putting words in your mouth, public relations exercise, but is it is it really part of central strategy? So actually, the, the way I'm going to answer that is by referring to a piece that David wrote uh, with Bob Cohane, where they analysed in 2015, the sort of interests that um, states would have, particularly in this new voluntaristic bottom up Paris type agreement. And, um, you know, the interests might be that you want to build new industries or you you want to play a leadership role. And there were I think there were four and I can't remember precisely what the other two were. You remembered more than I did, so I'm right sorry. there. You go. It's a, it's a. I, you know, my students have to read it. I, in fact, I remind myself I should read it again as well. It's a, it's a very useful, very clinical article. Mm -hmm. Now, what you discuss there, David, which I think is right, is depends on the size of the country and what their own political interests are on the international stage. Which of those interests are appropriate? So. For instance, with the UK now after Brexit being a you know slightly independent, smaller, smaller state, will have different interests than than the United States. And clearly, uh, as I've described in relation to China, having a leadership role in international climate policy serves their international political goals very well at the moment in their, you know, their difficult and complex and emerging role on the world stage and particularly because they're vulnerable um, uh, on uh, human rights and on trade. Uh, so playing a leadership role in this domain where they can unequivocally do it is a very clear and powerful political benefit. But I think as David has pointed out, actually the, the benefit to the Americans of playing a clear leadership role in climate is less distinctive. I mean, mm. for the US, it will continue to want to play a role through uh, global institutions on trade, on security uh, and so on. And, um, you know, the environment is in there, but it's not the main way in which American power will be product, pro pro projected through through leadership. It may be. And, and certainly while Kerry is there and his team, it'll it'll have a bigger role. But I think for the US, the value really of playing a leadership role is limited. Now, there I think it's much more interesting to turn to the EU. So the EU has always seen itself, always since the beginning, as the great leader uh, on the international stage, and it's 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 served the EU's role because it's a it's a very big, but it's not the biggest of mm -hmm. of the global powers, as it were. And leading on climate was a way of. Um, pursuing all sorts of economic and technological and diplomatic interests and it was internally cohesive as well for the it was another rationale for having a European Union that could be very progressive on on climate so I think actually what's so interesting about Biden is that it again I think probably re-emphasizes the role of Europe as a leader on the international stage and gives them a way of doing that. I think a, a point that Tim, Tim was making yeah. earlier as well. 
and that will also allow them to to address the very complex relationship they now need to negotiate with China um, because maybe they can lead on climate and reach agreements there and yet on human rights and trade they can do other things so again it's a, a whole configuration of interests and and different you know different states will have emerging different um, value that they get from leadership but for so the great leader i think in the coming period will continue actually to be europe with china as well that's my sense yeah, okay. yeah. so i was coming to you tim I, I also just so give me a chance to respond to that from franz but if you could also just comment on as yes, we spent a lot of time talking about yeah. china but how does this influence likely to influence other countries and then you know people have asked about you know brazil australia india who are clearly big players in the global environmental issues does, does this also impact yes so so the, the question I, I was going to pose with respect to leadership is whether leadership starts coming from bottom up uh you know imagine if we have another two years of significant climate impacts and california gets hit with another 100 billion dollar bill of wildfires and you know, uh, Midwest drought or whatever might throw at us next year and, you know, uh, uh, another unprecedented hurricane season, but some nasty hurricane sitting over Miami and multi-billion dollar of loss. I wonder whether or not that would create a new bottom up rather than just a change or, or, or whatever. I don't think, as Jim Hansen said in 1988, I don't think it's necessarily a knowledge deficit. It is an issue about how people feel threatened by climate change yeah. themselves and whether or not that will create a, a new dynamic. But the, the the overall issue about kind of the international, the reason I, I kind of plugged trade a little bit is that even in the absence of border carbon adjustments and all of those sorts of mechanisms, we do have an issue that at the moment uh, uh, we are uh, the trade system is allowing the undermining of climate goals because there is no comeback at countries that want to be high, high emitting. And you can see with the Trump China trade war that, you know, uh, and funnily enough, we predicted this at Chatham House on the day that Trump was elected that this would happen that, you know, Trump protecting the Rust Belt has a go at China, uh, China then has a go. Uh, on US um, exports, US exports, what was the easy thing to hit? So our agricultural exports, so soy exports from the US go down, but Brazil then steps into the bucket and says, oh, we can we can do soy really well. And that incentivizes deforestation and that climate conversion. So that that's outside the climate governance sphere, but that reality of the way that the countries interact in a dynamic trade issue to made made the global emissions envelope so much worse uh, in that sense. So so I think the dynamism, as we've just been talking through, it's not just what does a country say it wants to do for climate leadership. <laughs> it is this kind of global citizen envelope yeah. and how all of the parts fit together in a world which is very, very dynamic and because of climate impacts, increasingly dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, and that dynamism in, in itself is something from a political perspective. I think we haven't given enough uh, discussion. Okay. Uh, yeah, I agree. So I'm going to come to you, David, because I'm conscious we've got you for about two more minutes. <laughs> and um, there are just some questions in the chat about, and I think we all, we're all we all aware of this, the importance of the, the coal states in the US in terms of the, you know, the voting bloc and the, and the, and the public voice of that. Is, are we ever likely to see Biden ban? coal extraction in the US or, or at least implement some mitigation measures? Where, where does it, where does that sit? Well, I mean, he can't quite ban coal extraction across the board. Um, what he'll do is a bunch of infrastructure investments mm -hmm. and incentives that will have the effect of continuing to shrink the mar the mm -hmm. competitiveness of coal. I mean, competitiveness of coal is already half what it was in terms of market mm -hmm. share, thanks to the natural gas revolution. Um, so that'll continue on. And it's not, it's less that the coal states are powerful, the, the coal miners themselves, a very small fraction of the American uh, employment program. Uh, it's it's that the they are in some sense emblematic and symbolic of mm -hmm. what needs to be a strategy that's attentive to people yeah. left behind by this transition. They're, they're and, on and Brexit the fishermen, David, I think. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, this is this is not unfamiliar to lots of other parts of the yeah. world. Yeah, I guess yeah. the last thing I'll say, just to, just as as I have to leave, unfortunately, 
Um, I, I want to just under uh, endorse Franz's diagnosis about the incentives for leadership. And I think in the American case, the goal should be less trying to get the Americans to be leaders and more to be the, to get them to engage credibly. Credible engagement would be mm -hmm. a big plus, and that's going to require looking um, outside Washington. Um, it's going to require looking at the states, as I said earlier. And to me, what's been most striking is the is the volume of capital that's ready to move with changes in disclosure standards, awareness of the physical impacts of climate change. Uh, investor community is is already shifting, and we've barely begun to see that shift. And that's that's going to be the really big news, I think, coming out of the United States. And so, thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you today. And sorry, I can't stay. Thank you. It's been great. Talking to you, we could probably talk to you for another couple of hours, but thank you for spending the time. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. So I guess I'm going to come to you, Elisa, just on that last point about investment and global markets. And um, I think Richard's in the chat uh, questions put a question about Jeremy Grantham's um, opinion that the US is in that, that the global communities are in an investment bubble and we're, we might be ready for a crash. And how can you possibly sustain? investment and a society a community and economy towards climate change in in that kind of environment economic environment what can what can Biden do yeah well that's obviously a really hard question it is <laughs> about, a really hard question about, about yeah you know what, what what the direction is of the economy right now I mean I think building on what David said I think what is interesting is that the investor community as a whole does see a lot of opportunity in climate and they also see the risk of investing in things that may not be aligned with um with the trajectory towards a zero carbon future and also the trajectory towards mm. things that are climate resilient. Um, and so that means that if the investor community is becoming kind of climate smart, that is going to gradually influence the direction of opportunities there are for other people who aren't perhaps leaders in investment. Um, and it also might also empower regulators to make things that are currently proposed to be voluntary. So there's some voluntary disclosure commitments for businesses um, and also for investors. Um, this that will create possibly a virtuous cycle between regulation of investment um, and investment itself which again will help sort of channel flows of capital in the right direction which i think is really exciting of course that can't um act completely against the chance that we're entering quite a large economic downturn and there may be less capital available but it is interesting to know that investors might be selective and be making the capital that they do have available ready for climate smart investments. So that I mean, I think that means that we we've got the kind of investment community aligned with the transition that we need to make, even if we may not necessarily have the capital available to sort of make the scale of investments that we need most urgently. Okay, so I'm going to follow up that with a question from Anonymous, and and of course this Anonymous could be anyone at Imperial because it's a question about technology. Um, so you know, what what are the technology options should we be focused on and where are the technology gaps that will enable this and I guess it kind of links to Biden's um, proposal to form a whole new funding stream to do with climate technology um, and, and that obviously impacts the US but also the, the UK so at least I don't know if you want to come to that one yeah, I mean, I guess I, what I thought was notable about about this plan for you know technology investment is um, there are certain certain areas of clear opportunity, right? I mean, I guess electric vehicles. You know, the UK is also on the EV bandwagon, so you yeah. know a lot of people see a lot of opportunity. Um, also in hydrogen, so the kind of solutions to transport, which we see as now the growing and leading source yeah. of emissions. Um, so I think that's an opportunity that they see from a technology side, but also um, this statement about the opportunities in aviation and shipping. So aviation and shipping are a huge problem in terms of the scale of emissions. Um, they're behind really on technology development, and there's obviously a huge opportunity there in terms of pure play technology. I would say something else as well, though. I think it's very easy to be attracted by just the technology options, but within that, they've got other sort of digital smart logistics and also other kinds of um, process and services that are actually really essential to delivering mitigation um, so climate change emissions reductions and also managing impacts mm -hmm. and there is probably the opportunity to link a development of technology with also these other skills so engineering skills um, and also kind of process management skills mm -hmm. um, and also investment knowledge and this is pretty similar to what the UK also sees as our opportunities which yeah. would really be surprising um, but not wholly dissimilar and um, so so the pledge is 400 billion over 10 years right in this ARPA like um agency is that enough Any, frank what's the scale of investment we think we really need 
Well, you know, what, you know, how long is this piece of string? <laughs> I mean, I think I think you're 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 talking essentially about a you know, a complete retooling of the of the global global economy and therefore, you know, the scale of investment needed in the end. Uh, and state the governments will not will not provide the majority of this. Most of it will come through private capital in the way that uh, Elisa and David have been saying. And I think there are really important changes uh, in the way that capital thinks about, um, you know, the existing economy and the opportunities. And oddly enough, I think COVID and, and the pandemic has, has sensitised people now to the likelihood of really quite, um, uh, you know, epochal change in the kinds of technologies, the kinds of behaviours, the way we think about cities. I mean, a sector that Elisa didn't mention, of course, is, is buildings. Um, you know, one of the most recalcitrant bits of the energy system is energy use in buildings. And of course, there are lots of alternatives now. I mean, not just making them more efficient, but uh, Grant he, he he pumps all these kinds of things. I'm sure there'll be all sorts of uh, innovations around how you make net zero buildings and generalize that. Mm -hmm. um, but in the end, this is going to be a complete overturning of uh, of many industries, mm -hmm. uh, of many technologies, of many ways of doing things. And uh, you know, governments traditionally have had a role in research, development, and, and innovation. Mm. trying to keep that going but once you have the you know the, the learning curves and prices have come down so that things become competitive as they really are now in renewables mm -hmm. um then it's capital that does all the work for you and uh, and the consumer and the consumer is changing as well um now you know and that affects all of us so it's, it's a 400 400 billion is a good good start and obviously important and it sounds like a lot of money but actually in terms of the i don't know what the what the size of the, the u.s economy is but mm -hmm. it's it's 15 trillion or something isn't mm -hmm. it so it's it's, yeah. it's kind of you know it's a, it, you're you're looking at different orders of man magnitude so mm -hmm. yeah I think there's an interesting point around infrastructure and, and the, you know the, the infrastructure program that's going on versus the embodied carbon in steel and cement that has not been resolved technologically. So I mean, there's there are some interesting technology developments there to think about. Tim, I think you wanted to also come in on, on that response. Yeah, so so thinking technologies, of course, the, the other elephant in the room is, is direct air capture and biomass energy, carbon capture and storage and all of those sorts of things. They have enormous implications for whether or not uh, we need to have a radical, radical, radical rethink of our systems or whether it's just a minor tweak of our systems. And as Miles Allen at Oxford would say, we just put a DAX uh, unit on every power station and carry on burning the fossil fuel. Um, so so I think there's a lot there. But of course, that whole kind of negative technician, ne negative emissions technologies uh, has very significant land use uh, components which has very significant agricultural components. And the other big thing that we haven't talked about, but is clearly related is our food system not only drives emissions, about 30% of, of GHGs according to IPCC uh, on an aggregate basis, but it also drives significant uh, costs from an Ill, Ill health perspective. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how much is agriculture land use uh, negative emissions part of this emerging technology envelope that, that the US could play into. And then the, the other thing I wanted to flag again is that we do tend to think in terms of transition costs when we're thinking about technologies. But there's also the cost of not transitioning. And um, speaking as a professor of, uh, of population ecology, um, working on climate issues, I think it, I would be absolutely gobsmacked if there was not a strong climate signal underlying the emergence of COVID. And there was certainly a climate signal underlying the emergence of uh, uh, the locusts that have plagued Africa and Asia in the last year. We clearly have the direct impacts of uh, um, hurricanes and wildfires and so on. The issue is that how many hits to the economy do we need that are COVID sized? over the next decade or two, either to unloose the absolute shackles of lock-in to the way we do our stuff, or 
to suck up so much money that we can't afford to do any of this investment in uh, in the transition economy. You know, it's interesting thinking through the COVID issue. Everybody started off saying this is an opportunity to build back better. We're going to invest trillions of dollars on building back better. And then when you actually look at what the investment is, it's mm -hmm. to recover business as usual as quickly as possible. And my gut feeling is that if we don't build back better using these opportunities, we will kind of lock ourselves into a longer window that un under which it's more difficult to change and change is more marginal. And then climate might run away with us. So there is a lot over the next three, four years where the climate interacting with the political environment, interacting with the geopolitical environment, might drive a whole lot of new new dimensions to this. And, and Tim, are we in, and so you're talking basically what we would call as a, you know, a system of systems, right? So it's a complex interrelated multiple system problem. Are we in a position to be able to do it properly? And, and if not, what, what else do we need to know? Or who, do, who, do, who needs to be in that conversation to deliver building back right? Yeah, well, uh, this is part of the dynamic, you know, as, as Franz said earlier, I think, you know, we are all part of a global world mm -hmm. and our domestic is governed by our international and our international is mm -hmm. governed by our domestic. And so you end up with a complex system which effectively has locked itself into a certain way of doing things. It's highly resilient to change just at a time when we need to be as resilient as possible. So where does the disruption come from? The disruption is likely to come from new technologies or some large scale geopolitical or natural event that will drive things in a, in a strong enough direction. Otherwise, you're in a period of kind of decades of gradual evolution, but that might not get as far, fast enough down a systemic transformation. So, yeah. Yeah, complex. <laughs> no, it's it's complex. Franz, can I come to you to change the, the tack a little bit? So we've we've been talking about the climate crisis, and um, we're all aware of some of the implications of that. But one, of course, is water and water scarcity, and water supply. And how much do you think, if I guess, if we don't fix things in in a short of time, that that really starts to become, I guess, damaging internationally. Do, do, you know, uh, is there a potential for water for water wars, for example, for kind of weaponizing some of the resources that historically we, we didn't do? Do you think that's a realistic scenario? And, and if we get there, what, what, what impact will that then have on, I guess, the response to the climate crisis? Gosh, that's a big question, Mary. So the thing, about, question. The, thing about, the thing about water is that um, it's, it's, differentially di distributed of course i mean not not just through the year but but geographically and and there are wide variations and you know social systems and natural systems are more or less adapted to the kinds of variations that they expect so really in relation to water what matters is you know drought and flood in the wrong at the wrong times and whether you can cope with this or not and whether you've adapted to that and you know, any adaptation requires resources, so you need to invest in adapting to being resilient in different um, phases of that. Um, I think, you know, your, your your climate climate both produces too much water in some parts of the world. Our own, you know, Northwest Europe is getting wetter, uh, and and too little in in others, particularly during El Niños and so on. You know, droughts mm. and so on will will become more intensive. Now, there are ways we can adapt to that. I mean, you can develop in drought prone areas, more drought uh, resistant crops, you can have insurance systems, you can you can have humanitarian responses and so on. And I think, I mean, again, just going back to something Tim alluded to, the, 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 the problem is not so much water itself, because I think we'll, we'll probably yeah. learn how to how we deal with that. It's, it's to do with whether sort of in a in a in a, in a national uh, 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 space or, or globally perhaps you get two really serious global droughts i don't know in the in the in the midwest of the united states and in a major grain producing area like australia or something and then you have price hikes as you did in in 2006 i think and 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 real problems in in global grain markets and whether those are persistent and whether they become really destabilizing um but so i think i think the point about all adaptation to climate impacts is that 
we can do a certain amount of adaptation and we're doing adaptation all the time. It takes effort, it takes money and investment and that's what all this climate finance is trying to do. Um, at some stage you may reach a limit to your capacity to adapt, certainly in a particular place. It may no longer be possible to cultivate maize in certain parts of Africa or you know, mm -hmm. you might have to move to a more drought resistant crop, for instance. But uh, um, I think all of that will sort of happen. The, 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 the bigger issue around water is, is I think whether, you know, particularly around food and agricultural systems and of course, mm -hmm. you know, natural systems as well, whether there are such large global scale impacts that uh, you you aren't able to manage them anymore in markets and and with with transfers. Yeah. Does anybody else want to comment on that? Lisa, Lisa first and then Pen. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really interesting to then think about that that issue about water in the light of our question, you know, thinking about the Biden pre presidency, you know, and what what um, what do we see as the role there? I mean, I think when we look at, the, well, two things I would say. First of all, part of the Biden agenda on climate does look at things through the national security lens. I think that's interesting because that means that they're enabling some of these issues, even if they're, they're high risk, low likelihood events, it means that they're also a motivator for action and it also enables um, Biden to use different parts of his political complex to mm -hmm. take action on climate change. Um, I think that's really important also because what we've seen in the past with climate related security incidences is, is that climate is pretty much a threat multiplier. Um, and 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 therefore, it's very important that the preconditions are as stable as possible, that people who are vulnerable have those routes available to them to become less vulnerable um, or to be less exposed um, to those potential hazards. And so again, this goes back to what we said earlier about hopefully that these Biden years starting to provide a little bit more global stability or buy in to some of the global institutions that provide that pre-existing stability on which if we have to overlay some serious climate events, um, those most previously unstable parts of the world can be as resilient as possible to it. Okay, thanks. Tim. So uh, nothing really to add beyond what uh, Alyssa's just uh, riffed on, but I think the issue about the 2007, 8 and 10, 11 food price spikes was that they, uh, the perception of a shortfall in grain supply was what drove the market. So the international market amplified the climate signal, uh, which only had an uh, impact because of a whole range of other concatenating circumstances but the, the issue is not an absolute shortage in global water supply it is how we how the markets perceive the threats and how through the market mechanisms those threats get amplified and it's very possible to imagine all sorts of scenarios where there are real national security threats that arise because of climate impacts overseas that uh, flow through risk cascades across global global markets, across sectors and boundaries and so on. And just as a plug, the UK's climate change risk assessment is uh, going to publish its evidence report this summer and uh, chapter seven on international risks covers this in, a, in some great detail. Okay. I know so, because of the sweat of my own hands. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to reading it Tim. So I just wanted to turn to COP26 for a moment and, and you know, John Kerry described it as the last best chance for the planet. Um, I guess from your perspective, what what does a good COP look like? <laughs> what does a bad COP look like? Um, you know, what, what can we expect to come out of it? And, and I guess where are the key challenges in, in I guess, Paris was seen as very successful because it elicited a lot of agreement and, com and and pledges, if you like, but no enforcement. So, so what can we expect from COP26? So Lisa, I don't know if you want to start. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, in short, I guess a lot of people would say a good COP looks like Paris and a bad COP looks like Copenhagen, but that's mm -hmm. obviously unfair and ignores some of the detail <laughs> of it. I mean, in a way, in some senses, I mean, it's a bit tongue in cheek, but from, from, a, from a global perspective, a good COP is one that people perceive to be a good COP. Right. Yeah. We want we want everyone globally to feel a sense that we're moving and making progress on climate. But then we also need to actually be making progress on climate. Yeah. So I think I think some of the things that are important are a shoring up of the climate finance um, commitments before. There were some really significant 
commitments given on the climate finance front by the international community in Paris, they're not necessarily been met yet. We need to meet those and more needs to be pledged. And, mo you know, quite a bit of that money goes towards managing these impacts that we've been discussing that hit the hardest and most vulnerable in the world. But some of it also goes to pledges for emissions reductions from countries that have made them contingent on receiving some financial support. So there is kind of an important cycle there. Um, and then also on, you know, testing whether or not countries are really willing to what's described in the agreement as kind of ratchet up their agreement. So everyone made some commitments in Paris to emissions reductions, um, recognizing they're not enough to stay at two degrees, let alone well below two degrees. Um, and without further commitments to those this time around, we won't get that. Um, so that's kind of on the, on the negotiating front. We want to actually see those commitments happen and, and continued kind of global consensus and agreement um, on that. And is there scope for enforcement mechanisms, do you think, to come with this COP? Or do you think that's too far? I, I think that's just, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I'm sure France would have something to say about it. But I don't think that's the nature of these global international mm -hmm. agreements. I mean, it's a delicate dance. Um, I think it's, it's hard enough um, to make sure that there can be what's called the kind of transparency part, which is even seeing what people's emissions are and whether they've met their targets. And that that in itself is contentious enough. So I don't think there's a chance of policing, but that's that's why seeing big actors like the US stepping up and doing it is the important because no one wants to be left at the bottom of that pile. Um, and if you can't point your finger at them as an excuse, then you're going to have to start doing something. Yeah, Franz, with you. Yeah, I don't I don't have a lot to add, actually, because I think Elise has covered it. It's it's, it's you know, I, I think what the British government would like is is to have confirmation that Paris works. So the way in which we now do international climate policy, which was quite different up until Copenhagen in 2009, you had to sort of throw it all away and start again. It was reconstructed. And now you have this much more bottom up, voluntaristic pledge uh, pledge based uh, pledge and review. That's that's the system you have now. There isn't any enforcement. There are no legal commitments. It's a it's a it's a peer review driven uh, a system we have now, which is encouraging cooperation on a on a on a global challenge. And as you do that, gradually you might get to a point where you can collaborate more and you can start building these things and and making them stick uh, in a in a more formal way. But we're not yet there politically. I think, you know, the Americans have just rejoined Paris. It demonstrates again, actually, just politically mm -hmm. how fragile it still is at the international level. So that's one thing. And then the, 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 the second thing is really to do with trying to drive up the ambition level. So, you know, continue to get something, you know, the Chinese have made their pledge and that's good. Can, can they say a little bit more maybe about what they might, you know, what could the EU do further? It's obviously made its, 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 its position clear, but maybe in the, in the negotiations they could say, well, we'll just do a little bit more. Um, the Americans could become a little bit more clear about what they're doing. And then some of the other big countries, India, Brazil, uh, and, and some of the other big, big uh, other medium sized economies. So just getting everyone to sit up and, and make a make a slightly bigger pledge, more transparency so that this whole process becomes naturalized. And of course, the other thing that, that is starting now, which I think has to report in 2023, is this global stock take where the, the whole Paris regime takes a pause to do the maths, is this adding up? Are we going to stick to? Are we going to get to two degrees, or even better, one and a half degrees? Or are we way off? And do we need to invent something stricter, perhaps, and uh, where there are penalties and so on? So, the start of that process of the global stock take, which I think will be a very important uh, process as well, is what uh, is going to happen uh, in in Glasgow. And of course, there's an Italian leg as well. There's, a, there's an Italian leg to this. We, we tend to see it as a uniquely UK thing, but there's an Italian yeah. way too. So all of that and the sense of attention is so important and, and momentum. I mean, one of the, the greatest difficulties with any environmental policy, but certainly in climate policies, is maintaining political attention because you was waxing and waving mm -hmm. and high point stern and then everyone lost interest because we had a global crisis and now we build it up and then and then we have Glasgow and then we forget about it again for three mm -hmm. years so just getting attention and keeping it in people's minds in front of front of front of mind that's what this is all about and constructing 
yeah. you know, narr narratives and moments where people can say, oh, right, no, we are making progress. When's the next time we meet? And, and it's all of that, I think, that's yeah. important. Okay. Good. Tim, do you have anything to add? Or you uh, yeah, so so I think the loss and damage issue is vital. Uh, we need to find ways of of uh, helping poorer countries deal with the impacts of climate change that that uh, we have we have caused, rather than telling them that they have to sacrifice their economies uh, whilst they're at the biggest risks without the benefits. That's that for me is crucial. And then the other two things I think to mention are. Part of the climate ambition is not just the NDCs, but all the, also the zero net carbon targets and whether or not they're perceived as achievable or they're just long distance pledges. And it's been good to see over the last couple of months, a whole lot of uh, countries jumping on that bandwagon, including China, which we talked about earlier. And then the final thing I would say is that although they're not formally part of the COP, the campaigns are a mechanism by mm -hmm. which we can take out of, as David mentioned earlier, take out of the formal UNFCCC process uh, a new means of cooperating around the climate transition, the climate transition um, as a means of kind of driving uh, a, another form of international ambition. So whether it's around the sustainable commodities um, or, or, or the uh, electric vehicles standards and all the rest of that we were talking about earlier. So I think that whole kind of is their momentum to drive the ambition in a kind of broad sense as well as in a narrow sense uh, is a key thing. And then finally, I think there's increasing recognition, certainly within UK government, but perhaps also within China, about the read across from biodiversity COP to mm -hmm. um, a climate cop yeah. and then later in the year to the the un food system summit around some of the overproduction of food and the overeating food and the health impacts of that as well as the environmental impacts so i think part of the nature camp uh, part of the campaigns is to embed a broader approach to climate other than unf triple c but recognize it's part of a broader sustainability transition over Oh, no, that's good. So I'm consciously spending an hour talking about the climate crisis and we haven't so far had a single question about oil companies. And so I didn't want to, <laughs> I didn't want to break a rule. And Stefan has got an interesting question in the, in the, in the Q&A and I'm going to pose this to you, Tim, which is that it, last year it was very easy for investors to justify exiting oil because it wasn't a very good return. It wasn't a very good investment, but that's looking different now. The price of oil is back to $60 a barrel. Do you, do you think there's a risk that capital will flow back to oil or do you think that's now done? Um, I think the, the other thing to consider is the volatility in returns. Mm -hmm. It's just as important when you're making an investment decision as yeah. the expectation of the returns itself. Mm -hmm. So if you're taking a bet on the future of oil and you don't know whether you'll get two dollars or minus two dollars mm -hmm. or one hundred and two dollars, that is a reason not to invest in oil and right. betting on a movement in terms of hedging. Right. OK, good. So we're very close to the end. So I just wanted to give each of you a moment just to, I guess, summarise your main thoughts. And I'm going to take, I guess, Chair's action in asking you what you are most hopeful about for the future and, and what the change in the US politics is, is, is giving you hope for. So, Franz, uh, you started off being negative, so I'm going to make you end positively. Yeah, Mary, well, I'll do my best. Look, <laughs> I, I did start, I mean, partly for the purposes of a discussion. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it is important to look at the structural and historical drivers here, and, and we shouldn't take our eyes off that. On the other hand, of course, the Biden election is an important moment, and, and this is an important moment in international climate policy uh, because of COP, but also just because of the predicament we're in and the, the sense that things are finally moving. I mean, you know, we, we talk about this transition to net zero, we're, we're midway through the transition already. Mm. People always think we have to wait. No, no, this has been going on for 30 years already. Mm. These are long waves. They're very, very, um, you know, slow historical processes. Mm. We're, we're, we're in the middle of this and, and we'll accelerate. The next, the, the next bit will accelerate. And, you know, I think um, when the richest man in the world is, is making a living out of the, 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 the transition to 
Uh, I'm talking about um, Elon Musk, of course, is, 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 is making a living out of the transition to net zero, then you know the, the main work is done. So actually, mm -hmm. I know there's so much to do and yeah. so many changes in society will happen and many of them will be uncomfortable and there'll be many losers. But on the other hand, you know, the new world is opening mm -hmm. up ahead of us and I'm, I've always been uh, optimistic that this would happen and uh, I think certainly you know all, all your clever engineers and, and scientists at Imperial and so on and, and at King's indeed they've got huge careers ahead of them not not drilling for oil and you know mm -hmm. mapping mapping uh, geologies under the under 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 deep seas it's about you know how you, how you create this new energy system which is so much more interesting uh, you know how do, how do you power yeah. aircraft with hydrogen that's yeah. that that would be the good the good question to answer and 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 you'll make a billion i tell you so um that's the problem you need to be on forget about all that old stuff it's it's gone you know it's gone yeah. tim a moment of hope from you uh yeah I'm, conscious now I'm over time but I, I yeah yeah want to no, I'll, 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 just be, I, I'll just be quick i think um i've always been interested in complex dynamical systems and uh, I'm fascinated by the concept of tipping points. And I think, as Franz has just been saying, we are quite close to a tipping point in terms of uh, renewable energy being significantly cheaper than, uh, mm -hmm. you know, potentially even coal over a relatively short time period. But I think we're also very close to, uh, certainly in the in the global north, a social tipping point, which means that, you know, politically it becomes difficult to escape uh, the issues, not just the kind of demographics of Greta and Co. or, or Extinction Rebellion. And I think the, the mounting costs of, of the climate risks that we all experience mean that there is a, a recognition fast growing. So against that background, I think uh, uh, China being very positive about climate ambition, very vocally positive, America starting to be vocally positive within the constraints, Europe driving things ahead. We have a northern hemisphere axis that if we really do get our act together, it will enhance the potential for social tipping points and political tipping points to make things work. And so I am far more optimistic than I was at the end of last November um, because of this. Okay. And Elisa, I'm going to give you the last word. Well, now I feel very optimistic because of Francis and Tim's optimism, <laughs> which <laughs> makes me feel more positive. I think, I mean, just something little that makes me feel optimistic, which relates to some of what Franz said, is just the international students we come into contact with in Imperial and the people I speak to in other parts of the world in the course of my daily job. I think Tim is right that there's this access and, and a, a social tipping point in the global north. Yeah. But when you start to speak to people who are students from the global south um, and some of the other partners working with in the global south, um, the start of movement in some countries where this might be a very, very difficult transition and there are a whole range of challenges um the fact that there's kind of a body of people in those countries who are really super well educated understand this in depth in its full complexity and are working hard on this issue also gives me optimism okay thank you so it just remains to me to thank our amazing panelists elisa and franz and tim and david who has left us everyone that's joined us online and apologies if i didn't get to your questions um but it was really nice that there was such a, a, I guess, engagement from the audience. And to hope everyone enjoys the rest of Sustainability Week at Imperial. Um, thanks to the forum and the King's Policy Institute for the organizing of this event. And have a good evening. <laughs>